Hello YouTube, my name is Zach, and today we have quite a video upon us. I'm going to be analyzing Bjork. And before we get into Bjork, I have a few things that I'd like to talk about. And so it's going to be a few minutes before we actually get into the Bjork analysis. If you've never seen my videos before, I strongly suggest you hear what I have to say first before you skip to it. Because if you don't, you are going to go into this video with a poor conception of what I'm all about, and I'm going to take this video as an opportunity to make everything crystal clear. If you haven't followed my channel, you would not know that my last video was highly controversial. I analyzed a singer who has a rabid, rabid fan base. And because what I found is that a majority of the fan base did not understand exactly what my philosophies were behind what I do. The fan base went nuts over it, and it caused a catastrophe. And while I welcome discussion and critique and uh, counter ideas and counter arguments, I don't want my channel to become a cesspool of people bickering and arguing, casting insults and the like. So I know that Bjork is another kind of cult following type singer with a rabid fan base, and I do not want to rile you all up before you understand what I'm all about. So. First things first, you probably have already gotten maybe a slight notification or two that this is not a reaction video. I do not do reaction videos. My entire purpose is to break down the physical technique of a singer. I put aside the artistry most of the time, depending on the circumstances, and I look strictly at the physical technique of the singer. There are lots and lots of reasons for this. I cannot determine to you what is artistic. I cannot determine to you what you do with your voice or whether it's artistic or whether it creates the idea you want to create or not. That's completely subjective. What I can do is I can tell you if a singer sings in a way that is healthy or sustainable using measurable objective standards. And that's what I do on this channel. Anyone who's familiar with my content knows for a fact that I take the approach of vocal health first. And that supersedes any type of emotional impact the music might have on me. That supersedes anything that I might subjectively think about the music. When I analyze vocals, I'm looking at the health of the singer. How healthy is what they do? I do this because philosophically speaking, there is no way that myself as an educator, I, I teach voice professionally at a music studio. I could not live with myself knowing that I teach unhealthy habits that could eventually destroy someone's voice. The thing is, Bjork is a singer who proves my philosophies right. And by right, I don't mean that she's a poor artist. I don't mean that she's a poor singer. What I mean is that people who don't take care of their vocal health and they don't work to sustain their mechanism run into major impediments throughout their singing careers that singers who do care about health simply don't experience. Bjork is a perfect example of this. Now, one thing I want to say as well is that this is the new year. Happy New Year to everybody. I know I started out on a somber note, sort of, but here we are. This is the new year, and, and with that, I already had some changes I was wanting to make to this channel. I'm still going to do my long-form analyses like this one is. However, I do want to make shorter videos throughout the course of the week at various times to talk about more specific subjects that I can talk about more quickly. So that's coming down the pipe as far as the content of this channel. With everything out of the way that I've already said about Bjork, I want to point out that one of the biggest things that I want to address is what poor vocal health does to you as a singer. Bjork is, upon my research, and I, I'm not a huge Bjork fan. I've not really heard a lot of her outside of what I've what I've studied through, you know, just uh, figuring out what I want to make a video about and watching these these concerts and these clips to get an idea of how she sings. I've read some of her interviews. I've watched some of her performances, and what I found is that the, she is extremely intelligent. She's creative. She's inquisitive. She's well-spoken. She is researched. She's knowledgeable about many different facets of society, and she's ambitious. And those are all things that she absolutely deserves all the praise in the world for. She has no problem breaking barriers. She has no problem experimenting with things that are outside of the norm. All of these things are wonderful traits to have as an artist. But at the same time, Bjork is a crystal clear example of a singer who did things the wrong way. Now, before you get all up in arms, when I say the wrong way, what I mean is that she did not prioritize the long-term 
ramifications of the things she does with her voice. She had a major vocal injury about 10 to 12 years ago, and it impeded her ability to sing. And one of the biggest things that I advocate in this channel across the board is that if you are having vocal issues, you need to either find a coach that specializes in vocal health or you need to stop doing what you're doing. Ideally, when someone has a vocal coach, you work with someone who has a deep understanding of health and pedagogy and not just someone who passes them off as a a coach that helps you learn to sing better or helps you explore your own voice more. There is a major misconception that pops up that I find all the time in my professional career in which voice teachers that hold their singers to some sort of classical standard are looked at as stifling or uncreative or limiting. This could not be further from the truth. Bjork is a perfect example of this. If you read interviews from Bjork when she talks about her early career, her attitude was just make sound and be artistic and don't worry about anything else and just create whatever you want to create. This led to vocal damage. As a result, she reached out to some popular voice coaches in the rock realm that had worked with other famous singers to help her repair some of these things instead of going to someone who was either a doctor or a voice teacher specializing in vocal health and pedagogy. And what ended up happening is her issue, her nodule worsened. And when her nodule worsened, she then had to have laser surgery to have it removed. And she argues that her voice is better now, but she spent a long time without singing live at all. And if you look at her recent performances from 2018... you will see that her sound is less than consistent a great deal of the time, which is completely in the norm for someone who has nodule surgery. Very rarely does nodule surgery allow the singer to come back to full vocal form. It just doesn't happen because what's happening when you have nodule surgery is a lot of times they are literally removing a piece of the vocal mechanism that has become inflamed or swollen or blistered or calloused or whatever the element of the injury would be. It's an extremely precise surgery, and there are not many cases of great success with it. People can obviously survive it, but very rarely do people come through with a fully restored voice. And Bjork is unfortunately an example of someone who did not come through the surgery and end up being back in form. You see in some of the more modern Bjork videos, a lot of the commentary from the spectators, people say, well, what happened to her high notes? She doesn't have high notes. She's seeing all these low notes and she doesn't have the same sort of diversity in her sound that she used to. The reason is that her original sound wasn't healthy and she can't do the kinds of unhealthy things anymore because her voice has been permanently damaged as a result of it. So I say all of this to point out that if you ever have a voice teacher that tells you that the best thing you can do is just make your own sound. Don't worry about standards. Don't worry about principles. Don't worry about classical singing. Don't worry about that stuff. We're going to help you make your best sound. You should be wary of it because you do not want to end up like Bjork. Singing in a healthy way following classical pedagogical standards does not mean you're going to be an opera singer. It just doesn't. I have tons of students that learn my methods all the time, and I have a pedagogical, health-based background. And my, my education in voice is strictly based on vocal hygiene and health. It is irresponsible for a voice teacher to come forward and say, do whatever you want. It doesn't matter how it affects your voice. We're going to help you find your sound, and we're going to hone in on that. Or someone who just confirms your biases by telling you that everything you do is just fine, everything that you do is just perfect, and you can do it as long as you want, and they help you lean on it more. The best voice coaches look at everything objectively, and they take the sounds that you create, and they take those sounds, and they say, okay, this is something that you could sustain. Let's build on this. This is something that you probably can't sustain. Let's dial this back or let's try to find another way for you to do it. Or you need to at least be careful when you use this technique because it's not good for you. Bjork had a very poor voice teacher. She happened to run into someone who only enabled her bad habits as she was working on solving the nodule issue in the first place. Instead of going the academic or 
medical route, she went after a voice teacher that tried to convince her that she could keep making the sounds that she made and not do further damage. But it backfired. The voice teacher she went to teaches lots and lots of popular singers, and most of those singers have talked about having vocal injuries at some point in their lives. There are far too many people out there in the world that call themselves voice coaches, and what they ultimately do is they teach unhealthy habits and they sell confidence. They don't sell real vocal technique. They don't sell sustainable methods. They preach and they sell confidence. And there is nothing wrong with helping someone build their own artistic confidence. There's nothing wrong with that. But my rant here ultimately is that if you're a voice teacher, you have a responsibility to take care of your students' voices. And if you teach things that are destructive and it's proven that the things that you teach have destroyed your students' voices, you should be held accountable for it. Bjork had no vocal education whatsoever before she had this nodule. You can find it in interviews of her own. She will openly admit to this. She had zero vocal education. So she went to someone that had a reputable name and just assumed that they were trustworthy based upon the names of people that that they had worked with. It backfired, and that's not Bjork's fault. She should not be held accountable for that. But there are too many voice teachers that just teach irresponsibly. Bjork is an absolutely perfect lesson A perfect example of why vocal health matters. Having healthy habits does not limit your artistry. It simply makes you mindful of the good and the bad things that you do with your voice. Now, with all that being said, we're going to go into this analysis here. This is her performance of human behavior at the Royal Opera House. Now, I've already reviewed this. I've looked through it already. This is not a reaction video. I've I've done some quick checks on some of the things that she does technically. This is from 2002, before she had her vocal injury. And I picked this video because this video is going to serve as an excellent example of the types of artistic ideas that she was trying to express and the physical ramifications they have on her voice that at the time she did not know about. So this is a great example of an untrained singer doing unhealthy things in the sake of being strictly artistic. I do not want you to take away from this that being an artistic singer is a bad thing. Music is an art form. It's 100% an art form. But I feel that singers are best when they are the most informed. And so in this case, Bjork was not informed about the things she was doing with her singing mechanism. This video is pretty short, so the analysis won't be quite as long, but I am definitely going to touch on some things for you to see and to pay attention to and the the habits that she had that are good and the habits that she had that were bad. So without further ado, here's human behavior. Let's go. So there, that was a very nice example of her utilizing her head voice. So what Bjork does is she uses her head voice here to flip up into her upper range very effortlessly. It almost has like a, a yodeling sound. She's not yodeling. I don't want you to think that, but it, it has that effect where she flips up into her head voice. Let's listen to it again and pay attention for when the, when the pitch kind of jumps upward very quickly and the timbre of the sound changes. Right there when she sung the word me, you could hear that flip up. And that's perfectly fine, perfectly healthy. If anything, I advocate that to most of my students, that when something is high for you, just move it into that head voice because that's completely healthy. It's a completely sustainable way of utilizing an upper end of your range. Generally speaking, I would much prefer to hear someone utilize the head voice in in any capacity, whether it's with more voice on it or, or less voice on it like that was, than to hear them push as hard as they can to hit those notes in the chest or the modal register. What Bjork did there was very reasonable and and completely sustainable. So I would not chastise that in any way. One thing that's worth pointing out is, and you guys know I'm all about the tension thing. She doesn't really sing with a lot of tension all, all the time. Now, she does have some tension every now and then. We'll, we will we'll see later. But when she's singing in her mid-voice about like this, there's no tension. She's very comfortable when she's singing, and that's a great thing. If, you can, if you're singing in a, in a method that doesn't 
tense things up as much when you're in your like mid voice. You don't feel like you're like having to push to be in your mid voice. Then that means that you have a relatively well coordinated middle range, like modal register. It's when you start moving into the extremes and you your voice has to make adjustments for the changes in frequencies of your fo- your folds vibrating that you really start seeing whether or not they have good consistent coordination up and down the range. And we'll see. And- So that, when she went way up, you couldn't see her face, but that, you heard this, like the tone of the sound happened. There was a clear break in the sound that sounded like a rasp, and then the tone came back. So what's happening there is she is effectively closing her vocal tract as much as she possibly can, creating pressure buildup that releases when she uncloses things. And so when she closes the vocal track, the sound disappears. And what you're hearing is a the, the rasp is like this residual vibration or kind of like bumping together of the folds. That is about as destructive of a thing as you can do other than trying to inhale and sing at the same time, which that Leonardo DiCaprio looking dude that calls himself a voice, voice coach says you should do. If you've ever seen that guy's video on whistle voice, You should probably go get some kind of brain implant to take that out of your thought process because it's one of the most destructive and dangerous things I've ever heard anyone advocate in my life. And the dude should be like canned for it. Like there's no, no, no justifiable reason to teach someone that. Anyway, that's a side note. What she's doing here is absolutely destructive. Physically, it's destructive. And before you say, oh, well, you can do that if you train it. No, you can't. You cannot train yourself to make that not destructive. You can choose to do it and you can choose when you do it to limit the amount of times that you do it, but deliberately closing the vocal tract to cause a a rubbing together of the folds to create this like rasp, clean rasp, like upper fry sound will destroy your voice, period. I don't care if your favorite singer has been doing it for 40 years doesn't matter. Some people's voices are more resilient than others. Some people damage their voices and just don't care. It does not matter if some of your favorite stars do rasp. Think about all the people that didn't make it because they destroyed their voices trying to do that. Your your stars that make the rasp and they have a career are the exception. And the sooner you realize that, the better you will understand the entire concept of vocal health. What Bjork did there is not healthy or sustainable. I've said it a million times and I'll say it again here. If you provide me a case study that is independently peer reviewed, that can clearly advocate that you can make that kind of sound in a healthy way, I will start teaching it that day. If a longitudinal study pops up where people show proof that there is a long-term sustainable way of doing raspy vocals, I will add that right into my pedagogy. No problem, no question. But until then, I'm going to point it out every time what she did is destructive to the voice. So that, I'm stopping. There's so much to talk about with her singing that I I stop a lot because I hear a lot of things worth pointing out. That little phrase right there, she did something very interesting with her placement. She had her mouth wide open for the first vowel. You can see that big, really really vertical embouchure, which is fine. You know, when your embouchures, your lip shapes are open vertically, it's better than being out side to side. So that's not too bad. And then, so she had this note, uh, uh, whatever it was, and then she moved that into her nose. Uh, uh, She kind of did this thing where the the placement went from in the mouth to in the nose, and then she flipped up into her head voice. So it kind of went like that. She kind of did this thing where there was mouth resonance, nasal resonance, head voice. And, And so what that demonstrates is that she has an excellent sense of control of her registers and her placement. And I've talked in the past about not using nasal resonance and and how it's generally not good. However, if you know that you're using nasal resonance and you just want to color a sound briefly with a little bit of nasal resonance, it's, it's okay, it's not going to hurt you. So in this case, Bjork is using what I would consider and many pedagogues would consider to be suboptimal technique, but she's using it selectively. That's fine, that's fine, that's okay, it's okay, do it. So. 
I like the way that she delivered that because it demonstrated that she has a sense of control within her, her registers. Now, I don't think she necessarily understands the ramifications of those things. She's admitted as much in her interviews that at that time in her career, she didn't really know much about the voice and she didn't know how the things that she did affected her. So there is the argument that you can teach yourself to sing, but it never hurts to have a, a trusted pair of ears that can tell you, hey, this is healthy, this isn't. You know, she had a lot of really good things going for her and she had a lot of great control. And I feel like if she'd had a proper voice coach that cared about her long term health, she wouldn't have had the vocal issues she, that she had. And she could have been just as artistic. She demonstrates it right here in that example I just showed. They were terribly, terribly moody. Her, her human behavior. This whole section is kind of more speak sing ish. It kind of takes on that like theatrical element where, and I've talked about this before to where one of the biggest differences between like classical singing and theater singing is that a lot of times when, when a singer in Broadway is either, you know, not trying to sing a line or they don't, they don't want to, they can just sort of speak the words in like relative pitches. They may speak in ranges as opposed to singing something full on. And that's a pretty clear example of, of what Bjork did there. She took a more speak singing approach to that. One thing to really to point out for the health is that her her onsets are pretty poor. And I haven't talked about onsets in a while because for whatever reason, I've just run into a, a lot of singers that don't have terrible onsets. When she says the word every, you hear this uh, every, 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 every time you hear her do that, there's this pop at the beginning of it. That's a hard glottal onset where the vocal folds are sort of popping together. There's a buildup of subglottal pressure and the vowel, the beginning of the vowel pops the folds together. And that is another habit that's extremely destructive over time. Most of my voice students that come from singing backgrounds that haven't had training, what's one of the first things that, that we work out of their voices is those onsets because it's not something that's sustainable. The onset effectively is the way that the voice approaches singing words that begin with vowels like open, apple, even, ever, into, you know, usually, stuff like that. Those are all words that require onset since the word begins with a vowel. And if you allow that glottal uh, thing to happen, then eventually the folds will end up callousing or developing polyps or nodules. They harden because of the extra amount of force that's being pushed together when they engage. And that's really destructive for you in the long run. That's another thing that a, a good voice coach with a background in vocal health could he, could have kept her from doing because there really is no need to do that. I find that a lot of these contemporary voice coaches, you can find them on YouTube and on, they have their websites and things. Some of them so much as advocate to use that because it gives what they call an edge to the sound, but they never talk about the destructive principles of making that kind of sound. So I think that if you find a, Vocal coach that's based in health, they will point out to you that there's there's no need to do that because it's not something that's overtly noticeable to the unknowing audience. And all it does is causes damage. There's just no reason to do it. Same thing. She did that exact same technique. So she has built for herself kind of a singing vocabulary on her own of the kind of sounds that she wants to make. And she's gotten very good at making those sounds consistently. That does not mean that what she does is healthy. Being able to do something unhealthy consistently doesn't just magically make it healthy. Just like screaming and harsh vocals. Being a good harsh vocal singer with whatever good harsh vocal technique is does not mean that it's suddenly healthy. This is a perfect example of that. She's developed a method of singing that works for her music that's extremely unhealthy. That's the biggest assessment I can give of Bjork up to this point. Okay, so I'm gonna stop. I wish I could have, like, I wish there were a way that I could stop this, like, right in the middle so you could hear it. When she moved up to holding out that long note, when, when there was that interval that moved upward, you could hear her voice start to give out as she went to sustain that sort of raspy sound. To understand what I'm saying here, you, you have to have a little bit of a base knowledge of the difference between a sound that is being deliberately created and a sound that is happening as a byproduct of what the singer's doing. So let's go back and listen to that one line again. And what I want you to pay attention to is the difference when she moves up and the rasp begins 
the phrase or begins the melodic idea, and then when the rasp becomes a part of the sound that she's singing. So she'll be singing a clean note, and there's a rasp that kind of drags its way into the sound. Try to listen for the distinction between the two. It's very hard to point out the specific point to which I'm referring there, but there is a part where she takes the melody down. It sounds like maybe a third or a fourth interval, and the note that comes down when she comes down is covered in rasp. The difference in the sound is that her rasp before almost had a semi-supported sound to it, but as she carried it down and the rasp was kind of in her mid-range, it did not have that supported sound anymore, and it sounded like her voice was fatiguing. And then when she comes back in on that note before she jumps into her head voice, you hear that the sound has this like broken sort of affect to it. Like it, the, the voice is not fully there. It kind of has this like, like clawy, scratchy kind of sound. That's not intentional rasp. That is vocal fatigue. The way you can tell is through the sonic quality of the sound. It's very similar to if you go to a rock concert and you scream your head off. When you come back home, your voice is going to have this very kind of scratchy, raspy quality to it. Not because you are deliberately making the sound, but it's because the muscles of the mechanism are tired and they're having trouble holding the folds together. And there's a clear sonic difference between when she deliberately makes the rasp sound and when she does the sound that she just made in that clip. I don't know where this sat in the concert. I don't know how long she sung in this concert. I don't know anything about that. I don't know how frequently she took breaks. But I can tell you, based upon the sonic quality of the sound, that what you're hearing is vocal fatigue and not necessarily a choice of creating a raspy sound. See, even there, when she moved up in the range, when she was normally having a very clear motion upward that kind of on, on when she go, Duh, when she would go up like that prior in the song, there was a clear sense of line and consistency in her tone when she moved up. When she just did it that time, what you heard was a break in the sound and the placement of the sound was actually further back than normal. So whatever point of resonance she was using, to make the sound with that same melodic contour or phrase earlier in the song is not working the same way anymore. So she moves the sound into a different placement. Let's go back and listen again. I know this is complex. I know this is a little bit advanced, but unfortunately when someone's singing in this distinctive of a way, I kind of have to just sort of delve in. You hear how the the your vowel behave your vowel kind of almost turned into a human behave y'all oh uh, and it did this uh oh uh, kind of thing that's her placing the sound further back in the mouth than it was it's not up in the frontal like mid mouth anymore it's far far back so she's placing the resonance in a different space to try to probably pro probably to try to make the sound easier for her to maintain it could be a conscious choice but everything that i'm hearing up to this point is more suggestive of vocal damage or vocal fatigue than that being a conscious choice. If you even look at how, if you go back and look at it again on your own, you can see how much she starts manipulating her embouchure to create the sound too, whereas before her embouchures were pretty consistent. And so that is it. At the end, she does these screams, which I don't want to be too redundant. I've already been terribly redundant in this video, but same thing. Anytime you scream, you make that raspy sound, you're deliberately keeping the folds from closing and it's bad for you, period. So I know that this video was long-winded. It was probably cumbersome to make it through. Thank you for watching if you did. These are very important points. And I, I feel like so often in my experience with this channel, since it's come into existence, I have been misinterpreted and my ideals have been skewed by people who want to take my arguments and twist them into what they believe. I want to make this very clear. You are not going to convince me that a, you're not going to convince me that a approach to singing that is destructive is justifiable in comparison to one that is not. Artistry or not, I will not be sold on that idea. Not because I don't like the sound. I love metal. Uh, these, those people have terrible technique in that sense. But because as an educator, 
I have to take care of my students. I have a burden and a responsibility since I know about the mechanism to make sure that they do things that keep them safe and keep them healthy. I will not teach something that is opposed to that because then I feel like I would not be able to sleep at night. If there are voice teachers that don't care about vocal health and they teach people to make whatever sounds they want and that doesn't bother them, I guess that's their thing. But I will always hold that in lower regard than someone who actually cares about the well-being of their students' voices. You have to remember that the things that you do with your voice in every way don't just stick with you for that night. They stick with you forever. If you damage your voice, your voice is shot for good. It will never be the same. I gave you a perfect example of that a little while ago with Bjork. Post-surgery, her singing is not very good. Her voice lost something. It lost a sense of control. It lost consistency. And it's arguably less healthy now than it was before while she was doing all of the destructive stuff. So you want to avoid putting yourself in that situation. And The best way you can do that without being a scholar of the voice is to find someone who is. And I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about anyone who clearly, demonstrably has an understanding of the mechanism and the way that you keep it healthy. If you find a voice teacher whose philosophy is in health and hygiene first, you're in good hands. If you find a voice teacher who wants to tell you that the best thing to do. Oh, you can make whatever sound you want. You can sound just like Michael Jackson. You can sound just like Ronnie James Dio. You can sound just like Bjork. They all use the same methods. They use my method. That's garbage. And you should run away because they do not care about your health. They aren't the ones that have to live with whatever injury you cause for yourself because you are, you know, taking lessons from someone who makes you think that you can trust them. Big rant. Expect more of this from me in the future. I'm actually going to make a mini-series of shortened videos about singers before and after vocal damage, and we're going to look at some of who these people's teachers are. Bjork's teacher was Ron Anderson, and then Ken Tamplin claims that he's taught Bjork or, or uh, used her style or something. He has a, on his website, he claims that, that Bjork uses the Ken Tamplin vocal method. Well, look how that's worked out. Ron Anderson, Ken Tamplin all these guys. And I'm big enough as a channel now that I'm ready to start taking some of these people on, even if it means that they come after me for whatever reason or try to hit me with suits or whatever it is. It's more important to me that I get that information out to you all and you know something that's actually true and that these people are exposed for teaching destructive things and acting like they're the ultimate method of singing because they're not. And they do not care about your vocal health. They do not care about your long-term sustainability as a singer. They want your money. They want you to create a sound that you feel like you're happy with. And that way you'll say that they're amazing. And then when your voice is turned into hamburger meat 10 years later, they can just say, oh, well, that's not the case for everybody. Look at all these students we have auto-tuned that can do all these things really well. Look at this. Check out this example. They don't care about your vocal health. Find a teacher who does. Find a teacher who wants you to sing the rest of your life. Best advice I can give you. On that note, what a video. I'm done. I'm done ranting. I'm off my soapbox. I hope that this was educational, and I hope that I made my point crystal clear. On that note, I do give voice lessons. If you're interested in voice lessons, you can definitely tell by this what my approach is. Hopefully it gets the point across. I hope I did not offend all of you too much, and I hope that you understand where I'm coming from. My videos typically aren't this somber and they're not this aggressive, but you all caught me at a time where I released a video that was literally the most poorly received thing I've ever done in my entire life. And as a result, it showed me that there is no way that I'm not going to hurt some feelings if I want to tell people the truth. And if that's what it takes, then that's what it takes. I apologize if it hurts your feelings. I apologize if it makes you feel like I'm just insulting Bjork. I'm not. She was an easy example of someone who has used destructive vocal habits, and that's all there is to it. I'm not attacking her artistry, or I'm not attacking her music. I do offer voice lessons. I'll leave the information in the description in the comments. I do have a Patreon, and I also have a Discord server. So if you have any questions about this stuff, please hit me up in any way. I'd be more than happy to explain anything that I can to you. And if you have really any serious questions, and you you doubt what I have to say, or anything like that, I am more than willing to find one of my students, or anyone that I've worked with that can very clearly tell you how my approach to teaching or my approach to vocals does not affect your ability to be an artist. And I want to make that patently clear to you. 
not so you'll take lessons from me, but so that you'll understand that people like me that come from my philosophy are not out to stifle your creativity. And that argument is lazy and ridiculous. So anyway, that's it. I hope you all enjoyed this video. Look out for something else from me throughout the week. I'm probably going to make a shorter video coming up pretty soon about vocal damage. So look out for that. And I'm going to start making two videos a week, a short one and a long one. Uh, I'll probably put up a poll about my next vocal analysis. I may have a couple of interviews coming down the pipe. Who knows what's coming next? We'll see. Anyway, happy new year to you all. I hope that you learned something here and I hope that I didn't make you too mad. And I hope to see you all in the next video, whenever that may be. All right. Take care you all. Bye.